Yo, so guys, welcome back to another reaction, and this is a reaction to the insane engineering of the A10 War. I guess it's War Thog. Um, I might, but I might be butchering the name, but that looks like how you say it. So yeah, and this was suggested through this reaction I did, which is doing really well. People are like really enjoying this, which obviously is appreciated. But it's just interesting how some videos just sort of take off and people really enjoy them. And through that, people were suggesting to me like, to like react to other sort of other things um, similar. Um, I've done some of these videos in the past, like quite a long time ago, so I had a little bit of a break and now we're back doing them, I guess. And one of the top ones was um, check out the weapon mounted on the A10. So I don't know if this this, this is the specific thing, but this is on the same um, on the same topic. I don't know if it's exactly what he suggested or what they suggested, but there was a few comments that mentioned this, and there was also another one that mentioned this one and another one. If I can find it. It's probably here somewhere. I've just missed over it. But they, yeah, they suggested two different ones to see. So I'm obviously going to check that one out in due course as well. But yeah, we're just going to get into this. If you enjoy these reactions and you want more, obviously suggest it in the comments. Check this one out if you haven't already. Because this is sort of what's stemmed more of these reactions to come back. Um, and yeah, we're just going to check this out. Links are in the description to my new channel if you're interested in that. For those who want to see different kinds of videos from me. Links are there, same from Patreon, links are there. And yeah, that's it pretty much. Let's just get into this. So I'm guessing it's a plane, yeah? Oh, what is that? Holy shit, the sounds! The Fairchild Republic, A-10, Lightning Bolt, or simply the Hog, is one of the, the most Hog. iconic planes in the US Air Force. A plane developed in the middle of the Cold War with a specific type of warfare Looks in mind. Badass as hell. If the Cold War turned hot, one area was destined to become a battleground. A 50 kilometer corridor of lowland valleys called the Fulda Gap, where any invading troops would be channeled on their march from East Germany to West Germany. It was the shortest route to France, Frankfurt, and the strategically important Rhine River. If war broke out, this corridor would be a vital region to secure, and each side of the Fulda Gap was defended by armoured divisions. To cope with this threat environment, the US developed an operational doctrine called Airland Battle, and the A-10 was developed as a vital component of this strategy. A low-flying tank killer, which would work closely with the troops on the ground, to tank killer, bro. That just makes it seem even more badass. If your if your sort of nickname is the tank killer, oh damn, that is cool as hell. Pick up enemy formations at the front, while high flying bombers harass oh, the shit. supply lines at the rear. The A10 was a plane designed specifically for the role of close air support. Close air support is exactly that. Close. Close to friendly forces and close to unfriendly forces. Oh, wow. It requires a plane to be capable of absorbing Risky, a great man. deal of damage as they come under fire and to be incredibly accurate with its weapons to avoid friendly fire. Is this like showing what one of the planes has went through? I guess what many planes went through, but this is just an example of what they would go through when they sort of go through enemy enemy um territory or whatever. God damn avoid friendly fire. A plane with this role needs some unique qualities. It needs to be available at a moment's notice. In an ever-evolving battlefield, troops could need support without warning, and because of this... The Is this just a fucking big-ass missile as well? Holy shit! The plane needs to be nearby and ready to go. This means working from forward bases that may not necessarily have all the infrastructure and equipment that other planes need to operate. Its survivability needs to be best in class. Flying this close to the ground is going to result in every man with a weapon taking pot shots at the plane. As a result, the plane needs to be capable of dealing with small arms, machine guns, anti-aircraft guns, and even missiles. A-10s frequently limp back to their base with Mate. damage so severe that they would have downed another plane. With parts of their wings ripped off, with an engine taken out, and hydraulics unoperational. And coming with this, the plane Wait, needs- what? Let me just hear this so again. severe that they would have downed another plane with parts of their wings ripped off with an engine taken out and hydraulics unoperational <sighs> and coming Madness. with this the plane needs to be simple and cheap to manufacture the air force made it clear from the beginning in a battle of cost versus performance cost would be prioritized 
In an all-out war with the Soviets, quantity and ease of manufacturing was going to be a huge factor. Like the Sherman and the T-34 tanks, which were so influential in World War II, a future war between the Soviets and the US was expected to be won by whoever could outmanufacture and maintain their equipment. This plane was intended to be a cheap and rugged workhorse. Well, it needed to be well. made with readily available off-the-shelf parts, so maintenance crews could easily interchange parts to repair damage quickly and at a low cost. Contractors bidding for the manufacturing contract needed to consider all of these factors and designed the entire plane around the primary armament, which was chosen before the design process started. The General Electric... Wait, so we zoom out? I didn't even realize there was guns at the front. ...and designed the entire plane around the primary armament, which was chosen... Before Coming out the, the mouth as well. Started. That's pretty cool. The General Electric GAU-8A. A gun whose sound is so recognizable it has become a meme. The gun takes up a significant portion of the plane's what? internal volume, at become nearly six meters long, fitting snugly below the pilot. The largest part of the gun is the ammo drum, which typically holds 1,100 and... the size of this car! Fuck 50, me! 30 millimeter rounds. The I mean, the gun's actually bigger than the car, but I mean just sort of where the ammo is. are delivered to the seven rotating barrels along a linkless chute system, which also pulls the shell casings back into the ammo drum after firing to prevent the expended shells from damaging the plane. Oh. The belt system and the rotating cam firing system of the barrels are both driven by a hydraulic motor, which is powered by two independent hydraulic systems on board. There are two separate hydraulic systems to ensure redundancy in operation, and both run the gun. The left and right hydraulic systems are pressurized by two identical engine-driven pumps on the left and right engine. If an engine is lost or one of the hydraulic lines is broken, then the controls powered by those hydraulics cease to work. Crazy. However, the plane has been designed to allow Crazy it to continue flying on only one hydraulic system, as both elevators, both ailerons and one rudder have hydraulic power after loss of either hydraulic lines, ensuring powered control of pitch, roll and yaw even after the loss of a single hydraulic system. If Fuck both me. are lost, the plane that can seems like that, that seems like that would have been a really ahead of its time when these were first made as well. So I guess that's a thing now that's used in a lot of um, planes and like, yeah, like planes nowadays. But what, 50, 40, 50 years ago, whenever these were manufactured for the first time, it seems like it would have been ahead of its time, way ahead of its time. a version flight control system where the controls can be operated without power assist, which is difficult to say the least, but it can allow the pilot to land the plane safely or at the very least, allow them to get into safe airspace to eject. This kind of redundancy can be found in every component of the A-10 to increase survivability. The landing gear is retracted by the left system only, but it can be extended by both, and in the event neither system is available, the wing-mounted landing gear doesn't actually retract all the way into the fairings, which allows the plane to land with landing gear retracted with only moderate damage to the plane. Oh, shit. Protecting the control mechanisms through redundancy is just one component of increasing survivability. The fuel tanks are self-sealing on the lower portions and are filled with foam to prevent explosions. The A-10, like all planes, can fly with significant armor covering every portion of the plane. So they just protect the most vital component on the plane, the stick operator, otherwise known as the pilot, who sits inside a titanium tub which is reported to be capable of absorbing direct hits from armor-piercing rounds up to 23 millimeters. What? The canopy is also made from ballistic glass, capable of taking <sighs> hits me. from small arms. But this isn't the type of plane to be flying upside down over the battlefield. This is more for shrapnel from anti-aircraft fire and missiles. Okay. The A-10 also carries more chaff and flares than any U.S. Air Force legacy fighter. Look at the way it just shoots is them radar out. reflective material, That's which confuses cool, radar-controlled missiles, while flares confuse heat-seeking missiles. Wait, where the fuck is it coming from? I was thinking it was from the bottom. radar-controlled missiles, while flares oh, like here. confuse heat-seeking yes. missiles. The fuck? With four dispensers located in the landing gear pods and another four on the outer wingtips for a total of 16 across both wings. 
which can be triggered automatically by radar and laser detection systems on the nose and wingtips of the plane, or simply fired manually by the pilot. One of the most striking features of the A-10 is its strange engine plane. Bro, look at all these fucking different types of <laughs> weapon systems. You got it on the front, you got it on the back, you got all of them on the fucking wings. Now that's nuts, bro. Placement and tail configuration. And this too was a design feature to thwart enemies with heat-seeking missiles. That's a badass the plane. engines and tail were arranged like God this damn. to mask the infrared signature of the hot exhaust. You got more? You got these ones hit? I didn't even fucking notice them. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cost of the plane, which could be used to lock onto the plane by IR missiles on the ground. The tail would look more at home on a World War II bomber, which were designed to be stable. <laughs> Stability was an important part of the A-10's design. The large vertical stabilizers help keep the plane on target as it fires its insanely powerful gun. The gun is mounted directly on the center line of the plane to minimize the effect of the recoil pushing the plane off target. The recoil force at 44.5 kilonewtons is so powerful that it effectively halves the plane's forward thrust as each of the A-10's General Electric T-34 engines produces just 41 kilonewtons of thrust Holy but the plane shit. fires in such short bursts typically one to two seconds that the pilot doesn't need to worry about stalling wow. the high engines mounted behind the wings also reduce the amount of dirt and dust that can enter the engines from forward operating base runways which can be just dirt runways a lot of design choices were made to allow the plane to operate from remote airfields like this Smaller military planes like this don't typically have auxiliary power units, which are small secondary engines that large planes like airliners have. You can see the exhaust of these little hidden engines in the tails of airliners. These engines allow the plane to start its main engines without external help and help run functions like electricity generation and hydraulic fluid pumps. But it's unnecessary weight for most small aircraft and they usually use some other way to get the engine spinning. Sometimes this results in the plane relying on ground equipment, which the A-10 cannot depend on. And so an APU was installed between the two potted engines. You can see the exhaust of the APU just underneath the nacelles here. What? Some of the most interesting design challenges arose from the sheer power of the aircraft's gun. The gun spits out so much burnt and unburnt propellant that they actually lost an early model in 1978 after exhaust gas from the gun ignited and starved the engines of oxygen. To deal with this, some design changes were made. First, a small gas scoop was placed underneath the barrels to suck in some of that exhaust. The chemical mixture of the round propellant was changed to increase the flash suppressant levels. What? This in turn caused secondary problems as the new chemical mixture caused residue to build up on the cockpit windows and a canopy washer was needed which simply sprayed the washing fluid onto the canopy and the slipstream did the rest of the work. Circuitry was also added to force the engine ignition system to continually fire while the gun trigger was being pulled. Bro, is this, is this the view from the, the pilot? Oh, mate. Being a, bro, being a pilot, especially in like, being a pilot in general must be a crazy job. But being a pilot, like flying these fire, fire planes, etc. Mate, that's nuts. The responsibility you have in everything, like, God damn, it must be one of those jobs that is like, you cannot compare anything to it. It's just in its own league in terms of like the situations you deal with and the situations you put yourself in. While the gun trigger was being pulled, Look at the so view, though. that in the event a flame out occurred, the engine could rekindle its flame immediately. The GAU-8 Avenger is a monstrous machine designed to wreak havoc on those Soviet tanks attempting to push through Allied lines. To do this, they need heavy armor-piercing rounds. The rounds are truly massive at 30 millimeters and sprinkled throughout these rounds are rounds made of aluminium with a depleted uranium core. Uranium is insanely dense at 19.1 grams per centimeter cubed. Lead in comparison is 11.3 grams per Nearly centimeter double. cubed. <laughs> Iron is 7.9. This density wow. gives the round more kinetic energy for armor-piercing. The depleted uranium also ablates material in a way that self-sharpens the projectile, while tungsten, which is slightly denser than uranium, tends to mushroom out and dulls itself upon impact. 
There is currently 700,000 metric tons of depleted uranium stored as uranium hexafluoride in huge storage cylinders across America, costing uranium enrichment facilities a great amount in maintenance. They okay. are simply delighted when someone gets it off their hands and fires it at high speed into a country thousands of miles away. <laughs> it's a cheap and freely available resource and has the perfect material properties for armor piercing. But the efficacy of using depleted uranium is obviously not good. Many war-torn regions have blamed its use for elevated cases of cancer. Yeah, the uranium is very has bad, been under it? constant threat it's of retirement. Bad. Detractors have pushed from the very start that the plane is not needed. First, it was the F-16 which should take over its job, and now it's the F-35. Look at that one! The argument have that Bro, that's a bad boy looking plane. Look at this beast! It kind of looks like a bird, like a, a robin. <laughs> I don't know why I said that's a bad boy that I compare it to a robin, but it's weird, like, it, it's its body's so thick, but then the wings, obviously, they're wide. Like, they're, like, they're wide, but they're really thin. That's a badass now looking plane, though. And both sides of the argument have valid too. points. The F-16 and A-10 can carry similar amounts of ordnance into the battlefield if needed. Both have 11 hard points with a carrying capacity over 7.2 tons, but attaching heavy equipment to its wings negates the biggest advantage of the F-16, its maneuverability and ability to conserve kinetic energy in dogfights. The F-16 was designed to be a multi-role fighter, while the A-10 was designed for one job and one job only getting down and dirty and taking some punches like Rocky. While modern planes like the F-35 were so designed it can to be give, more like Muhammad Ali. It can give and take. Some can just give, but this one can give and take. It's an all-rounder. Bobbing, weaving, elusive, striking Dodging, and moving yeah. out of the enemy's range before see, they can react. The two planes were designed in completely different eras with completely different military doctrine in But for me, th that makes this one... I don't know. I mean, for me, this, that makes this one a bit scarier to sort of be in because you're sort of there and you know you know you're gonna take the hits. You're there to sort of give and take. In the other ones, you sort of know you're sort of bobbing and weaving. You're getting in and out of sort of the line of fire. Again, it's built for this, but even just a any human is the same. Every human is the same. You've got the idea of bullets being hit at you, and that's scary enough. But like, yeah, I mean, that's just. But yeah, I have a feeling this. I mean, they're both probably scary to fly in. Or maybe they just enjoy it, the people flying them. But for me, this one would be a bit more scary just because you're sort of like, like a sitting duck. A duck that can take it, but you're still a sitting duck. And trying to compare the two without acknowledging that... But who am I to say? The F-35 is designed to carry a small badass. payload of weapons in its internal weapons bay while stealth is a high priority. But it can carry just as much as the F-16 when air superiority is established. Okay. It's a multi-role fighter designed for the modern battlefield. Ultimately, the A-10 found a role in wars like Iraq and Afghanistan where the threat level and sophistication of enemy weaponry was relatively low, like the mm. battles expected in the Fulda Gap in the 1980s. The A-10 persists today because it excels in its role as a close air support vehicle and its low cost of running compared to other military planes has kept it competitive. Oh, it's actually, it I mean, it's obviously still a lot of money, but... You compare it to these ones, it's way cheaper. To be in the vanguard for military operations today, a plane the infantry can see coming over the horizon, like Gandalf arriving into Helm's Deep That's a cool to ass the clip. siege. Hey, kid, saving the day, kid, baby. Oh, this is the point of view. It's become an iconic. That is so crazy, man. Oh, this is literally it, like, in action as well. Then people are just sort of there waiting for it, I guess. Gandalf arriving into Helm's Deep to lift the siege. Hey, kid, saving the day, kid, baby. Now that's crazy. It's become an iconic aircraft among the soldiers wild, on the ground. Man. A bond has formed between it and the infantry it protects. But just as the A-10 was created in preparation for an anticipated next generation war, the oh, F-35 shit. was created with future wars in mind, where the threat environment will be so dense that simply being able to take a punch won't save it. The nature of close air support has continually evolved over the past century. In World War II, tactical air forces were created specifically for providing close air support to the troops landing in Normandy on D-Day. Range for these fighters was a major tactical issue and within 24 hours of the first men landing in Normandy, 
three new emergency landing strips had been created off the beaches, which would allow the Allies to extend their fighter-bomber range and prevent a fierce counter-attack by the Germans from overwhelming the small toehold the Allies managed to carve out in Normandy. I explored these vital logistical challenges in a future episode of the Logistics of D-Day that will be out next month. These airfields were primarily built to extend the reach of Allied aerial support as ground troops push forward. However, as the front line progressed, many were converted to supply depots, emergency evacuation posts and heavy bomber airfields. Others were simply abandoned and allowed to return to farmland over time. There are hidden traces of these remains littered all over Normandy. You can learn more about them. Wow, I just want to see quickly. Um, because obviously this was the main thing that was sort of said about it. They say if you hear the buzz of a war, a buzz of a hog. I'm just going to call it the hog. You're not the target. <laughs> wow. Um. Gun sound. I did briefly hear it, but I want to sort of have a video like where it's sort of about it. Oh fuck me! Sorry, I've just probably shouted down your ears. I'm a, I'm apologising for that. <laughs> Oh my days! <laughs> what the fuck, man? What? Okay, that's mental. Boy. Oh shit in hell. Look at this. This is the last one I'm going to watch because I'm scared that this might get blocked because I don't know about this video. But, I don't know, maybe it's not. Does it say it will? Maybe not. But look at this. Nah, I want to see it from there. Look at that. God. Is insane. Fuck me, that's one of the most brutal sounds I've ever heard. And get access. Mad, mad, mad. I hope this plane never goes out of service unless, of course, they somehow find a way to improve its design even further. A10, ease the interchange parts, ease to repair and at a low cost. The Honda Civic of the, U <laughs> the US Air Force. <laughs> A10's passive ability buffs morale of nearby crowd troops. It's just a morale booster, that's what it's for. It just boosts the spirits. To be I saw that in the clips and you can literally see that people, like whenever they saw it, it just sort of... It made them happier kind of thing. The A10 is my favourite gun for the simple reason it has... A plane as an attachment. <laughs> yeah, the plane is the actual attachment, for God's sake. But yeah, this is a crazy video. Hopefully you did enjoy this one. As always, I mean, if you want more of these reactions, suggest what you want to see next. I, s I feel like we're sort of going down a rabbit hole here. So, I mean, what other people are wanting now? Like I said, suggest it. I'll try and do it in due time. Because it's just, it's a different kind of reaction. And I like doing these, like, mixing up what I sort of check out. And this is all completely new to me as well, so... Yeah, I'm down to do more, but like I said, comment it if you want. And until next time, like, subscribe. Peace.